great place to meet that. Is. <laughs> they all come. <laughs> but this one is gay, and it's fun to talk about how happy we are. All right, now I got sound levels again. I muted myself for a second. One of the things that we often have trouble with as reporters, and something that I get asked frequently when people find out that I'm a writer, is where do you get the ideas for all those stories? And I just started working, in fact, on my own editorial calendar for my blog for the Orlando Sentinel, and I've set myself a goal of putting something up every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then doing other social media work every day, but at least to put up a column three days a week. Now, back when I was working for a daily newspaper, I would do that many stories in one day and still have to be working on a major feature for the big Sunday paper. So we were always stumped for ideas because you didn't always have a, a fire or a car crash or an election or something going on every day. So where did we get our ideas for doing our local stories? And usually we got them from watching TV, listening to the radio, and reading other newspapers and magazines. This is why last week, I challenged everyone to think about what you are reading because part of what you're reading ought to be sources of potential news, sources of ideas for stories that you might like to work on. So tonight I want to talk about that process of how we can take state, national, and international stories and localize them into something that you can work on. Now, when I taught journalism, at the first college where I had a full-time appointment, I used to do bonus questions on all the quizzes. And the bonus questions were pretty straightforward. I would say, tell me what's the number one national news story today? What is the number one Florida sports story today? What is the number one international entertainment story today? And I didn't care what the answers were. But my students learned that they had better listen to the radio on the way to school, and they'd better stop by the newspaper rack and take a look at the front page of the local paper, just so that they would have something in their mind that they might be able to use. I wanted to develop a news radar in them so that they would take the elements of newsworthiness that you learned all the way back in your writing for mass media class and be able to apply them to evaluate the news that they were consuming so that they would look at a story about an environmental disaster up in Alaska and think, wow, that was uh, an Exxon tanker. I wonder if that has any impact on the Exxon gas stations here in our area. I will go talk to some service station managers. Suddenly, the Exxon Valdez oil spill is a story that they can cover from Ocala, Florida, because they found a way to get a little slice of it that they could work on themselves. So with a little bit of creativity, you can take anything that you see on the news, anything that you see in the sports section or the entertainment section, and find a way to get a local angle on it that you can work for your own story. Now, there are advantages to this, and I want to get into them as we work our way through. The reason we want to localize major stories is partly because local readers have interests beyond their local hometown. Just because I live in Daytona Beach doesn't mean that Daytona Beach is the only part of Florida that I care about. So, what about my hometown, which happens to be Waco, Texas. Anything I hear about Waco sets up my radar. And before you ask, uh, yes, indeed, um, I know about the Branch Davidian thing. In fact, I have kinfolk who own the farms on the road that leads out to that compound. So going out uh, down the family farm road is how you get out to David Koresh's compound. So uh, uh, my little hometown of Waco has been famous for 
more things than being where Dr. Pepper was invented or where Steve Martin was born. Think about USA Today, the newspaper for people who live in hotels, or as I used to call it, the newspaper for people that only look at the pictures. There is a section in USA Today every day that has one or two stories from every state in the union. Why would they do that? So that while I'm sitting in the hotel and I'm looking at my free copy of USA Today that the Hilton people always throw at my front door, I can pop that open and I can see a story from Florida, which is where I live, a story from Texas, where I was born, or a story from Ohio or Maine, where I used to live. So no matter where I am, I can get a little touch of home every day. So this local content, being able to hook your local readers, can be very important. As much as people move around this country, and people are very mobile, more so than a lot of other places, just because they live in your town doesn't mean that they don't have ties to other places around the country. The idea of somebody being born, living, and dying in the same town, that is a very old idea that applies to fewer and fewer people. Second angle, a complex large-scale story may be easier to understand with local examples. So that if I want to really understand the federal budget, or I want to understand um, a potential government shutdown if no deal is reached by September 30th, or if I want to understand the Ebola crisis, any of those things, how am I going to make that sensible to people that live here in Daytona Beach or that live in your particular town? I don't think I've got any excuse to write a whole story about epidemiology theory and hope that anybody would read it other than uh, epidemiologists. However, if I can get a local doctor who knows about infectious diseases, or if I can find a church missionary uh, who has been to Africa, I could find local people who may have brushed up against the idea of Ebola and uh, protecting themselves from tropical diseases when they went overseas or inoculations they had to get before they could travel to certain countries. Those kinds of things would put a human face and a human scale on a large, complex international story. So finding that local person could be your hook to get into it. The other thing is almost strictly ego. People like to think that they are the center of the universe, that nothing interesting happened before they were born and the world will miss them when they're gone. How do we make those of us who have that sense that I am an important person feel connected to the major events around the country or around the world instead of feeling like uh, a helpless lump of flesh and water that's moving around for 70 to 80 years. By giving a local connection or breaking a story down to a digestible level, we can help readers feel more part of major events and also have better understanding of major events. One time I was covering a bankruptcy trial for a big development and resort out on Panama City Beach. And I was taking over the trial because the owners of this resort threatened uh, a lawsuit against our newspaper if we didn't get the drunk reporter who had screwed up the previous day's coverage off of the story. So the old drunk got fired and I got told at lunch that I was going to go take over that trial. Well, great. Uh, and I couldn't count on that guy's clipping since obviously he had messed up the stories. So I went in there, did the best I could, got with the court reporter, got some information, and wrote the best story that I could for the Sunday paper. I actually had people calling me that lived out in that resort development that said, thank you for explaining it to us. We had no idea what was going on until we read your story. So I think that's an important role for us as journalists 
to take these large, complicated, and abstract stories and bust them down to a level where the regular citizen who doesn't study this stuff all day, every day, has a chance to understand it at their level, to understand what they need to get out of it. So now I want to walk through how you can do this tactic in several different kinds of stories. The general principle, find people who have experienced some aspect of this major story personally. So maybe you find somebody who has traveled overseas and got some other disease. Maybe it wasn't Ebola, but maybe they got malaria or they got some other tropical disease and had to deal with that when they got home. So you could talk to that person to get some sense of the experience. Find local branches or outlets of something that's featured in the story. So go visit your branch banks or your local Home Depot or, or uh, whatever it may be that you have a local example of that is tied to a national story. For example, a while back, Home Depot, you know, was the target of one of the biggest retail hacking scandals and breaches of customer data that's ever happened in this country. I imagine if you went to your local Home Depot store and asked for the manager, they would be able to give you at least the official Home Depot news release and maybe give you a couple of comments about how it had or had not affected customer traffic in their store. You could do the same thing and go over to Target since they had been hit too. And the Target manager could tell you, oh yeah, our business has come back just fine. But that would tell people something about what was going on locally, that they go in those stores, they know those locations, and now you've given them a hook into understanding the national complex story. My favorite technique is the last one on this slide. Find a local instance that proves or disproves the trend of a major story. I was the only person in our newsroom that regularly read the Wall Street Journal. Not necessarily because I was smarter or richer than anybody else, but that in my intro to business class in college, the instructor got us all free subscriptions and taught us how to read the stock quotes and everything in there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, since we got free copies in the newsroom like we did of other major papers and magazines, I would pick it up and flip through it, and I would notice... <clears throat> national business trend stories that I could jump on and do locally. Just a moment. <clears throat> My throat got dry for a second. So, let's say there was a story in the Wall Street Journal that said, single-family home building is in a slump. And they had national statistics from the U.S. Department of Commerce or something. All I had to do was get out my phone book. It's kind of a papery thing that has uh, everybody's name in it alphabetically, and then there would be a number next to it that you could call them on. I don't know if you've seen phone books or uh, are familiar with them, but they were very important tools for us in newsrooms. So I would go through the yellow pages and call a few local home builders and just say, Bob, how's it going over there? Uh, how's business for you these days? And it didn't matter to me whether my six or seven local home builders matched or didn't match the national trend. What I was able to do was tell my local readers what was going on locally versus the national trend. We even did a thing. The Associated Press would move a story every month called the Market Basket Comparison where it would just take a, uh, a basic uh, cart, uh, shopping cart of groceries, gallon of milk, dozen eggs, loaf of bread, can of tomato paste, so on. And they would give you the national average retail price for those items and compare that to what their average was the previous month to tell us generally are groceries getting more or less expensive. When that came out, I would go visit three or four local retail chains, and I would write down their prices for generic bread, milk, eggs, butter, and so on. I'd come back to the office, 
do a little bit of work on my calculator and pop out the local average price. And didn't matter to me again whether we were higher or lower. But what did our prices compare to national averages? And I still hear that story being done in different ways all the time. Like when AAA comes out with the national average for a gallon of gas, I hear on the radio what it is in Florida and what it is in the county where that station is broadcasting from. So these are pretty standard journalistic gimmicks that we all do in order to fill our space where we have to do some writing. Now let's talk about how to localize political stories. There is a huge difference between campaigning and governing. Right now, because we have midterm elections coming up, there's going to be a lot of political coverage going on in October and into early November. And depending upon how some elections turn out, there might be recounts and protests and all kinds of things coming afterwards. So right now we have a lot of campaign news going on. In fact, Congress is shut down. They're on leave while they all go home to campaign for re-election. So you don't have any government business really getting done for the month or two months before most major elections. Now, to localize a campaign story, you can talk to your local supervisor of elections and see how voter registration is going on or other uh, local activities like that, if there are petitions and ballot initiatives that are potentially going to get voted on. The community where I used to live on the beach actually had a big election over how tall hotels and condos could be. Because if they started building 20-story condos on the east coast of Florida, every morning we would be in the shadow of those buildings. Because the sun rises in the east, you wouldn't have any sunshine in the town until afternoon, and so that got voted down. There's also been some interesting maps here in Florida about counties where Democrat or Republican is the third largest party registration, meaning that of the big two, one of them has fallen behind independent and no party affiliation. So, that's interesting to see the trends of what's going on in different counties. And depending upon what county you're in, maybe you break that down by precinct and find certain parts of town are registered differently than others. So there's lots of information that could be done at campaign level. Every county pretty much has a local Democratic or Republican headquarters. So you could just pop in there and ask them how they're doing. And each of them will tell you their side of the story. Now, after people get elected, then they have to go about the business of being the government. Now, localizing government stories means that you could go talk to local officials who represent federal or state agencies that happen to be in the news. Remember back when uh, there was a furor over the IRS targeting certain types of interest groups for greater scrutiny? Why not go to your local Internal Revenue Office and ask to speak to the agent in charge? Or if there is a question about property taxes, go down and talk to your local tax assessor or, or uh, property appraiser or tax collector's office. If car tags are going up in your state, then go to the local tag office. Uh, here in Florida, we have just a kaleidoscope of specialty license plates for every college, every pro sports team, every hobby, every branch of the military, all kinds of things. If I was a highway patrolman, it would drive me crazy because you could look at a license plate and wonder whether or not that was a real one. But going to your local tag office and finding out who's buying the new license plate that just got announced, that could be an interesting story. So you can always go to your local office to get news about a state or national level story. So in politics, you've got the campaign group of stories, and you've got the government group of stories. In business, as I said, there are lots of ways to take national business stories and tap them into your local market. One thing that you can always do is talk about personal finances. 
what we call the kitchen table issues. So if prices are going up or credit card rates are going up, right now there's a whole lot of talk going on about bank fees where they get you for $35 for every overdrafted check and it costs you up to $5 or more to use an ATM machine if it's not from your bank and all these little nickel and dime fees. I hear some banks actually charge a fee if you go into a branch office and do a transaction at the teller window. They would rather that you did it at the ATM machine yourself because they would like to have less tellers. That way uh, they can cut their personnel costs. So they charge you a little bit extra because you went in and talked to a human being. When big companies start announcing that they're going to lay people off or they're going to expand their plant or business in your area, anything that takes the job picture down or up, that's always going to be interesting. In fact, I just heard on the radio news today that Walmart is about to get rid of health insurance benefits for some segment of its part-time employees. So I don't know whether that's going to be an Obamacare thing or if it's just going to be that once people get down below a certain number of hours, they're not going to get benefits. But I think that would bear watching. And that would be a story that if you went to your local Walmart and talked to a few employees in blue vests as they were coming out, you might get some quotes. And then, as I said about the home building story, business trends may or may not be happening locally. And as a journalist, you really shouldn't care whether it's up or down compared to the national average. All you care about is telling what the comparison is between the national average and your local story. In sports, yeah, that's a picture from Florida State. I'm prejudiced. Major stories can have local hooks as where pros played college or high school ball. So here in Orlando, the metro area where Full Sail is located, one of the players from the Orlando University got drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars. So that's kind of a big state story. But he played high school in Oviedo, which is a little suburb of Orlando. So on NFL draft day, one of the radio stations actually went to his high school and had his high school coach live on the radio. So depending upon who you have access to in your area, you may have up and coming players who are connected to your hometown or maybe you've got legendary old time ball players who have retired in your town. Maybe you don't have big league sports, but you maybe have a minor league team where some guy is passing through on his way to the big leagues. So there are lots of avenues by which famous ball players can pass through your town. You could also be taking a look at fitness and exercise trends that might be going on in local gyms. The health and fitness industry is very interesting in that they jump on whatever the current fad is. So uh, when aerobics were big, uh, even my Taekwondo school opened an aerobics room. So you had women in leotards doing Jane Fonda video stuff while we were all uh, preparing to fight in tournaments. I felt it kind of diluted the gym. But the gym owners needed to make some money, and having more customers meant that we had better facilities to train for our fights. Then, of course, with the rise of Ultimate Fighting Championship, every martial arts studio now teaches mixed martial arts. Now, a lot of them don't know any more than what they used to. They just changed the sign out front. Um, spinning classes where people get on those bicycles and uh, pedal at different, thing, uh, different rates with an instructor coaching them through some routine. Or this CrossFit where people do uh, weightlifting and cardio and alternate and kind of shake up their body's rhythms. So when these exercise trends or fitness trends start passing through um, the national media, you might find that happening in the local gyms. Like there's this stand-up paddle boarding where you sort of stand up on a surfboard, but you have a kayak paddle and you paddle yourself around. And that's kind of a fitness trend that's caught on real big here uh, in the rivers and inlets here in the Daytona area, which reminds me of windsurfing back in the 80s when people stuck sailboard poles onto surfboards. And that craze caught on back when I was in Panama City. 
So anything that is going on that is a national trend, or if you see it on the cover of a magazine at Walmart, Go to a couple local gyms and ask them, are you guys getting into this? Do you have any plans to add this to your exercise program? And then you might want to pay attention to sports teams that have boosters in unexpected areas. Um, you would expect that here in Florida, you might find uh, different sports bars and things devoted to the Miami Dolphins or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But we've got some here devoted to the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Cleveland Browns, probably because northern people retired down here and brought their home team with them. Here in Florida, because there's such an uh, animosity between Florida and Florida State, between the Gators and the Seminoles, and I went to both colleges, I'm kind of torn. I actually won a prize for the long drive contest in the Seminole Booster Golf Tournament played in Gainesville, home of the Gators. So there is a Seminole club in the middle of Gator country. There is also a Gator club in Tallahassee, the heart of Seminole country. I often wondered how could I, as a Dallas Cowboys fan, ever move to Washington and live there in enemy territory because Washington and Dallas are such rivals in the NFL. But there are booster clubs all over the place for everything, and it would be interesting to find out how people who are strangers in a strange land get by being fans of the wrong team in their given town. In terms of entertainment and the arts, Big story broke today. Robert Downey Jr. all but confirmed that there is going to be an Iron Man 4 movie. Um, he'd kind of like Mel Gibson to direct it, but he, uh, uh, I think it was either on Oprah or Ellen that he announced today that uh, he's up for doing it. Now, major stories can have all kinds of local hooks, like where stars grew up or went to school. Uh, my grandmother up in Ohio actually had Clark Gable as a math student. And when you have things like that, that gives you a local reason to tell childhood stories about uh, this person or that. So uh, people don't know that Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, went to Florida State. So all these little angles could give you a chance to do a story without ever having to go to Hollywood or New York, but you found a local hook to the national entertainment story. There may be people connected to that that are living in your area. Uh, I had no idea how many people at Full Sail have worked on major albums, major tours, um, major TV and movie productions. I think we had 12 or 13 graduates that worked on the Avengers movie. We've had sound and uh, lighting people that worked on tour with Madonna. So that would be a reason to get a story about one of them, you know, uh, Madonna announces new tour. We talked to local student who worked on one of her previous tours to get some uh, backstage gossip. You may also have major entertainment properties that have fan clubs in your area. Right now, since the TV show Dallas got canceled by TNT, there's a whole grassroots campaign going on on the Internet to try and get that picked up by another network or maybe move it to Netflix, but to keep that show in production. So wouldn't take much to go on Facebook or some other social media to find local fans of that program. You know, there used to be Sex and the City watching parties in different bars, things like that. So you could find uh, opportunities for localizing national entertainment stories. Uh, here uh, in Orlando, for example, a mother-daughter company started one of the biggest comic book and pop culture conventions uh, in the country that is an annual big draw. And in fact, tomorrow, um, the Channel 6, the CBS affiliate, is going to have an interview with them about how they got it started and how it grew so big. Lifestyle and family. Uh, I think everybody was a child of somebody. So we have all had parents. At some point, all of us probably have thought about having children. All of us have health, good or bad. All of us have been or hope to be in significant relationships. 
So again, you can take any social trend, and I don't care whether it's same-sex marriage or getting tattoos, anything. It, there might be a national story, and you just have to find a few local people that are getting in on it. For example, this little photograph here is about a dance school that is holding classes specifically for men who are about to get married so that the man will actually know how to dance when he takes his first dance with his bride and with the mother of the bride and all of that stuff at the reception. A man who is not confident about being a good dancer could go to this dance school and get his preparation for dancing at his own wedding. Parenting trend stories are always of interest to anyone with children. And in my case, uh, once my mother became older and in ill health and I took her in to live with me, those parenting stories became those stories about how to care for older parents because it kind of reversed our roles. So that became something to think about. Relationship stories. Um, I remember. <clears throat> my newspaper sending me to do a story about a Christian singles club. And this was before internet dating like Match.com. Pardon me. <clears throat> but my editor wanted me to find out whether this was some cleverly disguised swingers club or whether it was legit or whether it was just an old lonely hearts thing for old widow women or what it was all about. Turned out to be totally on the up and up and a nice uh, nice thing, and I did get one good French dinner out of it, so it was okay. But the point was, anybody who is single is going to be interested in reading stories about dating and how you meet people and all of that. So that we always have some reason, just as human beings, to be interested in different stuff. Now, the lifestyle and family section is what we used to call the society section of newspapers, because that was where you would have the uh, coming out parties and engagement and wedding announcements and things like that. But since we don't really have society like they did in the days of the Great Gatsby, now it's lifestyle and family. It's those things about daily living that are not associated with one of those previous sections like politics or business or sports. So all of those things about regular people tend to be in this lifestyle and family department. Okay, questions or comments about any of those? I'm going to turn the mics back on. Okay, so... Deborah is on mute. Joe is unmuted. Your mics are hot. Questions about what we covered tonight? What I'm hoping is that this presentation will take away the excuse of I couldn't think of anything to write about. Because based on this, there are about 20, 25 different ideas that you all just got on how to take anything you see at the magazine newsstand or anything you hear on the radio and turn it into a story that you could do locally. Because one of our great problems as writers is when we get stumped, when we can't think of anything to do and we're staring at that, that blank screen. Ah, uh, hi, Joe. I see your uh, question about can you start your assignments for weeks three and four earlier? Yes, yeah, shoot me a note separately to my uh, campus email and let me know what your reasoning is. As far as the discussion board stuff, I think it's better that you do that during the same week with everybody else because half of that assignment on the discussion board is giving each other feedback. So I prefer that you weren't doing that ahead of everybody else because you got to be in the conversation with everybody. But as far as the stories that you're working on, if you've got an idea for your story for week three or week four, and you happen to be able to get that interview now, go ahead and nail it. Get it in the can. Because you don't know if, something, if somebody's going to go out of town or there's bad weather or any number of things could come up to mess up your story. And I actually had one student uh, last month who got jammed up like that by the publicity agent that she was working with, 
who hung her out to dry on the photos that she needed. So um, fortunately, I was able to uh, work with her on a way to get around that. But yeah, if you can go ahead and get content and store it up and then write it up later, yeah, go ahead and do that. Go ahead and cover an event or uh, go get your interview, whatever it is that if something is available to you, do it. Like um, next weekend, the Air Force Thunderbirds are going to be flying next to the beach. And um, I'm thinking I'm going to go shoot it, even though I've shot the Thunderbirds several times, but getting them out over the open ocean. Yeah, I think those are photos I need to go ahead and get just in case I need them. Um, as far as hard word limits, Joe, I don't count words. I want you to write as much as you think you need to write to tell me what you're talking about. What I don't want you to do is burn a whole paragraph telling me something that's in a photograph that you have posted. So don't waste time being redundant telling me what's in a photo or a graph or giving me information that is in the audio clip. I think you've got to do some setup in your text to frame your multimedia elements, but tell me things that I can't already see for myself, or tell me something about it that's not readily apparent from the photograph. So, uh, but 50 to 75 words, if you go to 100 words because you got that much to say, I won't complain about that. If you come in at 25 words, I'm more likely to be upset. So, uh, do as much as you need to to tell me the story. When you guys have me again in month 10 and you're working on longer pieces, I won't care if you put in six photos instead of five if all six of them were really good. If all six of them are ordinary, just give me the three best ones. So part of what we're trying to train is your news judgment that – this is my best photo. I'm going to play it big. This is my best quote. I'm going to start the story with it so that you're always giving me the strongest stuff that you got. Uh, during the week, you've got my cell phone that's in my contact information. So whether I'm in the office or out and about, um, you can always text me and then we can make a, an appointment to talk over the phone. Since my classes are small, it really doesn't bother me. I don't mind taking uh, time with you on the phone at odd hours. Uh, I've actually talked to students on the phone before going into a restaurant. I've, I've talked to them from the parking lot. Um, the work email is fine if you just need to make sure that I'm getting an assignment. Like if uh, FSO is acting up and you want to email me an extra copy just to make sure I got it, that's okay. But since we're in and out of the office, uh, odd and even days, um, you can't count on me to answer the office email, but like maybe every other day, it, it depends on what our work schedule is. But if you've got my uh, direct phone number, not the full sale phone, but my personal phone, which I put there in my contact information, then you can hit me with a text and then I can call you back and we can uh, uh, hook something up. Um as far as writing, it's a personal skill, but I think there are two things that you can always do. One is that um, the Full Sail Writing Center has got really nice people over there, and I have sent people over when I notice particular things that I see somebody uh, doing repeatedly. For example, sometimes people do not put in enough punctuation. They write long sentences that ought to be broken up into maybe three short sentences. So if I notice that trend, then I might refer you over to the writing lab to get some coaching on that particular thing. But I try not to refer anybody until I've diagnosed a specific problem. The other thing that will happen is that you'll see when I give you feedback on your articles, I will rewrite sentences for you. I'll rewrite your headline. I'll suggest what maybe should have been moved from one paragraph to another. The two things that I would strongly recommend to everybody, number one, outline, not necessarily formal outlining, but uh, make a list, let's say one, two, three, four, five, what do I want to put in these five paragraphs? One is my lead, five is my closing, two, three, and four are my body. I see, Joe, you talk about passive voice. I learned 
active voice first because I came up through journalism school before I went to graduate school. So then when I started writing academic papers, I wrote everything in active voice and they wanted me to make it passive and dispassionate and objective. So you have the opposite problem that I did, but the solution is the same. Flip the natural order of the way that you would tend to write a sentence. I'm going to say the quarterback threw the ball. Passive voice would be the ball was thrown by the quarterback in a spiraling arc across a gray sky. Well, in that construction, the ball is the first big word we see in the sentence, which is actually the inanimate object. Without the quarterback doing an action, nothing would have happened. So sports writers and journalists are going to write active voice almost all the time because they're going to tell you Holyfield punched him with three lefts and a right, and they're going to make the boxer the guy they write the story about. They're not going to write about the misshapen face of the guy that's losing. So most of the time, news writers and sports writers are going to go with active voice because they want to get to tell them the story of what's going on. Academic writers who want to take emotion out of the story are going to lay back and, and make the victim of the activity the star of the sentence. Hmm. Joe, the question about getting a better verb, I always want the most accurate and explicit word that you can use. Um, I believe I sent a link around to a YouTube video that I did on how to construct sentences. It's about 14 minutes, but it gets into that whole thing about picking the best and most precise word. So I can say person, I can say man, but as soon as I say plumber, you see a fat guy with a butt crack bent under your sink because plumber suddenly makes it specific. When I say dog means nothing. When I say collie, you see lassie because it controls the way the reader pictures what's going on. I give a lesson in my business classes about the difference between stagger and stumble. Let's say you are the clerk at a convenience store and you see outside the uh, store, somebody fell down in your parking lot. You go out and look and he's cut his leg and torn his pants and he's going to sue the store. Well, when you write that up, and you write down that he seemed to stagger and fall. The word stagger implies he fell down on his own. He was drunk. He was high. He was clumsy, whatever. It's his fault. If you put down he seemed to stumble and fall, then in that report, would a crafty lawyer think that means that there's a pothole that was unrepaired? There was garbage that was not picked up. There was a, a curb that was not painted yellow. So it's now the store's fault that the guy fell down and you got to pay the man. So when you go to selecting a more precise noun or verb, you got to make sure that the meaning it carries is exactly what you mean to say. Because I can say walk and I got left foot, right foot. But when I say march, pace, stagger, stroll, saunter, all of those things carry extra attitude. So when you put that word in there, make sure that its conscious and unconscious meanings are the one that's, that you want in there. But I much prefer strong, precise language rather than um, the man stood there. That's just not an interesting uh, action-oriented journalism sentence. The body is for details. I want the opening graph, your summary lead, or the nut graph. That is usually as much as the local radio stations ever read out of my newspaper stories. Because in my first 25 to 50 words, yes, I paid off all of what my story was about. However, the body becomes where I give the details. How did it turn out this way? Why did that city commissioner vote against it? What is this really going to cost the typical taxpayer in this community? So my details are how I build out the story. Think about in freshman English when you had to write all of those essays 
and you had to write comparison contrast, and you had to write cause and effect, and you had to write chronological. All of those standard essay forms are still useful in journalism because if you're telling the story of a political campaign or a football game, it's a process. It had a beginning, a middle, and an end. If you're telling some uh, factual story, then you're probably going to be breaking it down into component parts. If you're uh, telling me how life is in the high mountains of Colorado compared to here at the beaches of Florida, that's comparison contrast. So I'm going to be talking about somebody that moved here from somewhere else. What was that like where you were? What do you think about how it is here? So now it's comparison contrast. So those same basic freshman essay outlines, you can still use them here. You just have to understand whether your story is a process story, a personality story, comparison contrast. How, how do you structure the story? And then suddenly uh, that freshman outline becomes very useful again. All right, guys, any questions in closing? Because I got an eight. Uh, oh, all right. Last last question, Joe. The most common multimedia elements used by most journalists. I'm going to presume that we're talking about online as opposed to newspaper, magazine or TV, because each of them, the format, uh, the delivery mechanism kind of drives it online because we have the opportunity to use anything we want to. It gets to be, again, the right choice for what you're trying to do. There's the old saying that if the only tool you got is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. As multimedia journalists at this point now, you have learned enough about writing, photography, editing, layout, audio, video, that you've got a whole toolbox. The question that you have to answer is, what tool do I need for this task? If I am telling a story about a new local band that is going to be playing at some club on the beach, and I don't have a music clip in my story, that's a fail. A music story without audio, that's no good. Um, if you're telling me a people story and I don't have a picture of that person's face, that's a fail. If you're telling me a story about an activity, and I don't care whether it's a soapbox derby or if it is that dance class for clumsy grooms, I want a video clip because I want to see some motion of this activity. Um, your story about character, you have to find what is the element of that person that makes them interesting. And that's what you develop. Everybody was born, everybody's going to die, everybody eats, and as the famous children book says, everybody poops. So, I don't necessarily need to know everything about this person. If this person is a concentration camp survivor, I don't want to read about they collect stamps. I want to read about their experience coming out of the camp. If this person is a disabled veteran, I don't want to read about him going fishing. I want to read about his adjustment to life after the military. If a uh, girl I used to date she was the youngest of 13 children, large Catholic traditional family, okay? What's it like growing up as number 13 of 13? Uh, my grandmother, in fact, was one of like 14, 15 kids because they used to raise big farm families back then, source of free labor. So growing up in a big family, growing up as a twin, moving here from France, why are you doing the story about this person? What is it that made them interesting? And you want to plumb the depths of that. Make me understand why you got curious to know more about them. So everybody is interesting. Everybody's got a story to tell. But for some reason, you seized on this person as being somewhat interesting. So tell me all about that. Um, I assume this person eats on average, two or three meals a day, sleep somewhere between six to eight hours, all of that. Yeah, I don't care. But if you interview a guy that is a night watchman and he's got to sleep in the daytime so he can be awake on his post all night, 
I might want to know how this guy adjusted to being nocturnal for his work. Does he also stay up all night on the weekend and sleep all day on Saturday? I don't know how that works. So that might be interesting to find out. So if him being a night watchman is what made him interesting to you, go all over night watchman and what it's about. So uh, it doesn't matter if it is the bagger at the grocery store or the mayor of the community, whatever it was that made them interesting to you, work that. Because we will assume that the other things humans do, they do them. What I need to know now is the surrounding stuff about what made them interesting. So think of that as like a solar system. The sun is what made them interesting. Now only tell me the planets that circle around that. I don't care about any other galaxies. I just need to know what revolves around their interesting trait. All right, everybody. Uh, good questions. Good questions. Um, I, I want you guys to get into really developing this stuff. But one of the things I cannot tell you is how many pictures or whether you should use audio or video or color or black and white or any of that kind of thing, because part of what I have to grade you on is your news judgment, how you execute it. But obviously, if you give me three paragraphs of facts and figures on some economic story, that you could have told me all of that in one graph where I can see a line go up or down. You better give me the graph instead of two paragraphs of confusing figures. Because that's why we make graphs, to make numbers visually understandable. If you tell me somebody has a, no, an assignment can never have no text, because you have to at least explain to me who this is a picture of. Even... Even if you look at a TV station's website, and one of my buddies from college is now a digital news manager for an ABC affiliate, even a TV station's website is not just going to have pictures for you to click on. It's going to have to have some titles and captions and a paragraph or two explaining what the story's about. Otherwise, I'm not going to click on that square to look at that video. So unless it's got naked people set on fire, I'm probably not going to click on that video box. you got to give me some words to tell me why that's going to be interesting. So you've got to have something to it. Now, the story may be mostly audio, and I do tell some students that uh, they should look at national public radio and look at some of their uh, audio features because some of these stories uh, – if it's a nice interview, maybe it should be done in a radio format where almost the whole story is as if it's an audio clip. But I still want to see a picture of the guy that you interviewed. I still need a paragraph or two to tell me why I should click on the audio uh, button, why I should click on play. So you got to have something to tell me what's going on. And if you don't have text, how will search engines ever find you? Because they read text. Even a photograph, they read the alt tag and the caption. No, I'm not brilliant. I've just made all these mistakes before. I'm just telling you what I did wrong. Okay? All right, guys. We'll catch you next week. Stay in touch with me uh, during the week. If you got a problem, feel free to text me. All right. I'll talk to you all later on. Good night.